Hello guys, Winston here. My custom CNC router upcycling project is coming along slowly but surely. I already have a delightfully sturdy table, an economical frame, and a beautiful gantry rail. What's next on my list to do now is fabricate an x-axis carriage plate. Like this one, but in aluminum. This plate is what will link the spindle and z-axis assembly to the rest of the machine, and it's the keystone of my plans to build a better shape oko. Because there are features in the design that can't be laser cut, like counterbores, because there are features in the design that can't be laser cut, like counterbores, I'm going to fabricate this piece on a CNC machine. And because there's a couple threaded holes on this plate that I want to be located fairly precisely, I'm going to make this on a Daytron Neo. Okay, so that's not really a good rationale. That's like saying I need a vehicle that's faster than my SUV with comparable payload capacity, so I'm just going to purchase an LGM-30 Minuteman III Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. The Daytron is admittedly overkill. An HDM would do just fine. But it is super convenient because it allows me to machine an aluminum plate on both sides without needing a custom fixture for OP2 thanks to its trick vacuum work holding system. But before we get there, I think it's worth backing up a bit to explain why I'm doing this. Because I'll bet some of you are thinking, Hey Winston, hasn't Carbide 3D shipped literal metric tons of perfectly good CNC's using this exact extrusion profile already? What are you doing that requires reinventing the wheel? And the answer is, yes, there are thousands of shape ogos humming along just fine in people's garages, and no, technically I don't need to do any of this. But the truth is, as an engineer, I can't leave well enough alone. And my boss might make me regret saying this, but I think I can improve the value proposition of the humble entry-level shape oko. Please step into my Fusion 360 workspace and allow me to explain. This is the x-axis carriage plate assembly used on the Shape Oko 4. It's a nice thick aluminum plate with the means to easily mount a z-axis assembly, useful features to accommodate things like drag chain mounting brackets, and of course a quartet of upgraded v-wheels. These are beefier than the ones used on the Shape Oko 3 with more meat where it matters to reduce deflection between the bearings and the plastic. Now, improved as they might be, V-wheels will always have a bit of a reputation in the CNC router world. If you search for very long on the internet, you'll inevitably find one or more cranky wannabe machinist boomers ranting about machines like the Shape Oko 3. Blah blah blah, you're wasting your time if you're buying a V-wheel CNC. V-wheels aren't for serious people, you're just going to end up with a multi-thousand dollar paperweight. To me, that's ridiculous. It's like hating on a Honda Civic because the BMW M3 exists. If we already have perfection, why bother making anything else? If linear rails and ball screws exist, why use V-wheels and belts? Here's the thing. No one in their right mind would argue that these things are equivalent. One obviously is the higher performance option no matter how many exhaust tips you put on the other one. But these things also don't cost the same, which creates value, and that's a quality all its own. If the Shape Oko 4 cost as much as a Shape Oko 5, I would be a V-Wheel hater too, but it doesn't. V-Wheeled machines are meant to be a decent and affordable option for the masses. And in my book, the more people who can obtain, learn, and leverage digital fabrication technologies, the better. However, just because we can give V-Wheel machines a break because of their value, doesn't mean we can't try to raise the bar. I have a theory that the rigidity of a machine like the Shape Oko 4 can be easily improved. It might even bring it closer to parity with a linear rail machine like the Shape Oko Pro than you'd think. How? Simple, by increasing the contact area between bearing surfaces. What's better than 4 V-wheels? You're never going to guess this. 8 V-wheels. Mind blown. Before I go on, I should point out that I'm not the only one to have considered this approach before. Two other examples come to mind. One is the Open Builds lead CNC which uses 8 wheels on the gantry, but it then just uses 4 wheels on the z-axis, so that rigidity gain is kind of wasted. The other is the Shape Oko 2 and its direct derivative, which I shall call the former carve. They used 8 V wheels contacting two sets of V profiles. Great idea, unfortunately the rigidity of its gantry rail was woefully inadequate for any serious work at any significant scale. But in my case, I've got a beefier gantry rail, and my z-axis will be a super rigid HDZ, so nothing is stopping me from exploiting the full benefits and rigidity from employing 8 V-wheels on the x-axis. 
except for some pesky laws of physics that prevent two different objects from occupying the same volume. The Shapoko 4 X carriage design that I was going to rip off doesn't have enough room to fit four V-wheels on top of the gantry rail when you factor in the belt hardware needed for locomotion. But we can work around this. The architecture of my CNC router leaves a little extra room on my X-axis for over-travel, so I can afford to make my X-carriage plate a little wider in strategic areas like this. This form factor even kind of looks like it was meant to be an homage to the original Shapeoko 3 with a belt-driven Z-axis, which I think is a neat throwback. At the bottom of the X carriage, there's no belt hardware needed, so I can just space out V-wheels as needed. But that placement does mean that those extra eccentric nuts needed to make the lower V-wheels adjustable will be interfering with the HDZ. The way around that is going to be to mod an HDZ to make clearance. And if I was going to do that, I might as well go the extra mile and lightweight the entire HDZ, right? I would be a fool to pass up that opportunity. But don't worry about that for now. This video is about the x-axis carriage, and here's the final design. So, now you know the what and why of this part. Now for the how. How do we go about machining this plate? Well, it just so happens that prototyping flat plates is something the Datron Neo is particularly good at. That's not to say you can't do this on other machines, and in fact I machined my first x-axis proof of concept on a Shapeoko, but there are several aspects of a Neo that make it highly desirable to use here. Accuracy is obviously one, but the vacuum workholding system of the Neo is kind of the star here. It simplifies setups immensely. It also doesn't make it foolproof, and I made some mistakes along the way I'll share later in the video, but it does genuinely help the prototyping process along when you don't have to think about workholding and making custom jigs or fixtures for secondary operations. I'm going to be starting from this piece of cast aluminum plate that's about as wide as I need, a fair bit longer, and 3 eighths of an inch thick. That works out to about 9.5 millimeters, which is a nice but not excessive bit of extra margin for my 8 millimeter thick carriage plate. I want to skim off a teensy bit off the top with a fairly large 8 millimeter end mill to ensure it's flat, then cut out as much as I can from one side. Counterbores, pockets, threads, chamfers, the profile of the plate, all of this is pretty straightforward except the thread milling. On a vacuum table, your cutting tools can't go below the bottom surface of your stock. You'll cut into the vacuum table, lose suction, and bad things will happen. But a thread mill does need to go past the bottom of a hole to create full threads. How do you square those two competing requirements? A critical part of my plan here relies on the fact that my stock is thicker than my final part. I'll skim as little off the top as possible to allow my plates to sit on a 1.2mm bed of extra material. This means I can overbore my pre-tap holes and have enough margin under my part for a thread mill to machine full threads. And that's the cam for OP1 in a nutshell. It's no different than programming a part on a benchtop CNC really, it's just that everything is more aggressive and mistakes are scarier and more expensive. With that done, let's look at the physical setup for this part. The Neo I have at my disposal is solely equipped with vacuum workholding. The first thing I need to do is figure out which vacuum zones I want to open or close to focus the vacuum pressure under my stock. On top of the vacuum plate goes VacuCard, which serves as a gasket, friction enhancer, and airflow regulator. It means small through holes in your part won't instantly tank your vacuum pressure. It's conceptually similar to the MDF used on big CNC routers with vacuum workholding systems, something semi-permeable to distribute the suction evenly. On top of that, I'll set my aluminum plate stock. When positioning isn't super critical, I'll often use the front right corner as my origin. I don't measure anything, I just line up my stock with the edges of the fixture and program my part to be a couple millimeters inside the outer bounds of the stock. It's kind of like using a corner square or fence on your CNC router. It provides a nice, easy, repeatable enough place to use as your origin that doesn't require you to probe your stock. I'll turn on the vacuum, open the valves, check that the vacuum pressure is reasonably close to negative one bar, and check that the stock is stuck on good. On the control screen, I'll select my program and check the simulation to make sure it matches my expectations. Then there's nothing left to do but say a prayer to the machining gods and punch go. My program started off pretty well. For the most part, I was employing cutting recipes that I've used before. I faced off the stock, cut some pockets and profiles, things started off really well.
And I wish I could say everything went 100% according to plan, but that would be an alternative fact. Even though I've been using the Neo on and off for a couple years now, I still make mistakes. Disaster struck when I was boring out my holes that were supposed to get thread milled for M5 screws. I was using a 3mm end mill to make 4.2mm diameter holes 8.5mm deep. A hole this narrow relative to its diameter doesn't let chips fly out easily. The net result is, I clogged this end mill. As soon as I heard the cut quality degrading, I turned the feed rate override knob to zero and halted the program. My 3mm single flute was shot. Not necessarily dead, but it wouldn't be doing any more milling today. I set it aside so I could try to save it with sodium hydroxide later. I instructed the Neo to use an alternate 3mm end mill instead. One that I probably should have used from the get-go, but long skinny end mills scare me. I think about how they're more fragile and prone to deflection, and I usually end up underestimating how tough they really are. I set the Neo to jump back into my project where I'd halted it. Thankfully, the last of the small holes was bored successfully. I wish I could say that was the only mishap I had, but a little further down the road I made another mistake. I forgot the Datron Next post-processor in Fusion doesn't work with canned drilling cycles. It won't respect settings like multiple passes if you select a thread milling cycle. So when I went to thread mill these two M8 holes, the poor cutter was subjected to way too much material engagement. I still have no idea how this tool survived, because all I was able to do for it was crank down the feed rate and let it grind its way through the aluminum partially clogged. Once a tap or thread mill is undercutting in material, you kind of just have to let it run its course. The lesson here, if you're using a Datron, is make sure you use the thread toolpath in Fusion, not drill toolpath, if you want to thread mill a hole. So that's two strikes to my name now. Will I get across the project finish line without breaking an end mill? Who knows? The only way to find out is to press on. I got the rest of the thread milling done, gratuitously chamfered everything, and then cut out the profile of my part. The most satisfying part of a successful vacuum workholding setup comes at the end, when you separate your part from your stock remnants. You might notice the puck of material that I left inside my lightweighting hole on the X carriage. That's by design. To machine the back of my part, I'm still going to be using vacuum workholding, so minimizing air leakage is a high priority. Keeping this material intact for now presents more effective surface area to the vacuum fixture. Here's the summary of my plan for OP2. Remember I left over a millimeter of excess stock here? It was so I could elevate my workpiece and start a thread mill properly at the bottom plane of my part. But now I need to clean it up, so I'll start with a facing operation. I'm restricting it to operate solely on the plate itself and not the excess remainder I left connected. That plug is meant to stay in place for the duration of this operation to maintain vacuum pressure, but because of its relatively small surface area, it's not going to endure a lot of force, so I'll just machine around it. After this step, I can go back to do some of the boring and thread milling that I'd previously deferred. You know that I'm paranoid about chips collecting in narrow channels and holes, right? With this M3 hole, asking a 2mm end mill to punch through 8mm of material would have been a big ask. Instead, I created some clearance in OP1, and now I only need to bore 6mm down in OP2. I don't need full threads here, and this will be way less stressful. Once that's done, I can champ for the backside. Here's how that plan played out on the Neo. On OP2, lining up my part with the corner of my table isn't good enough. I'll need to precisely locate my part. Using the visual probing system in the Datron Next control software, I set up touch points on the rightmost tab of my part and two points on the bottom. The Neo probes twice on one side so the system can compensate for small degrees of rotation. I've got my zero set, program selected, correct end mills in the machine, and workpiece secure. That's the checklist I always go through. Time to hit cycle start. And almost as soon as I started to machine away the top layer of excess stock, I realized I'd made a mistake. Remember how I was trying to maximize the strength of suction under my part for OP2? That's why I left the plug of excess stock in the middle? Well, in my infinite wisdom, the first thing I did here was to sever the connection between that plug and my part. The bottom of my part is pretty skinny, not a lot of surface area. 
It would have been held more securely had it been linked to the neighboring material. This mistake manifested in very fine lines after surfacing that you could feel with your fingernail. Kind of like what you would get when there's tram error in the spindle. As I did my final phasing pass on this plate, it was lifting and deflecting a tiny fraction of a millimeter each time. It wasn't catastrophic, but it meant my part wouldn't have that silky, smooth, almost mirror-like surface that Daytrons are known for. That's on me, but that's also life when you're beholden to the limitations of vacuum work holding. It's both a cheat code and a handicap. You've got to be smart about how you use it. The last of the operations went down just fine though, and I was very relieved when I pulled my part off the Neo. Catastrophe had been averted three times, and despite small flaws that most people won't ever see, I was pretty happy with the end result. Now I had to get this part onto the Frankenoko. In my home shop, I installed all the extra hardware that had to go on the plate. The motor standoffs and stepper motor, idler bearings, upper V wheels, and eccentric nuts. After that, I could lower the carriage plate onto my gantry rail and install the lower V wheels. Pay no mind to the fact that my gantry is already mounted on the machine. When you last saw the Frankenoko, I know only the side rails were installed. You didn't miss a video, I'm just going slightly out of order. With a small tweak of the eccentric nuts, I got all four wheels in contact with the gantry extrusion and I was technically done. But this video wouldn't be complete if you didn't see the Z-axis installed as well, so here's what it looks like with an HDZ bolted to the carriage plate. Honestly, I think it's pretty dang magnificent, and while I can't give you an exact quantifiable reduction in flex, it's noticeable. It feels way more solid, with negligible penalty in rolling resistance. I wouldn't go so far as to say it's 100% more rigid than a Shapeoko 4, but I would be comfortable pegging the relative improvement at greater than 50%. But ultimately, this subjective measure is not what matters the most. The rubber has to meet the road. The performance needs to be validated with an actual cutting operation. So in my next video, I'll be getting the Frankenoko fully assembled and running, something I'm very much looking forward to. And this might be a bit of a spoiler, but even though I'm championing V-wheels for their value, that doesn't mean we can't take things to 11 in other departments. I want to thank you all very much for watching, and I'll be back soon with the conclusion to my ridiculous CNC build.